Welcome one and all to another day here at the Damage Report. I'm John Idarola as always, but not as always to our great regret. Adrian Lawrence joins us once again, the queen of Rebel HQ as well as indisputable. Definitely on Tuesdays, every Tuesday, but also a lot of the other time too. Adrian, it's always good to have you on. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, great to have you here. We got a lot to talk about, by the way. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you had a good experience. So we went out and we stirred up some stuff with the FBI and with a whole bunch of other things generating news around the country. That would be an interesting conspiracy theory that the false, the news wasn't false flags from the government. The news is false flags from the news. They were creating it to then oh, cover it. I'm gonna write that fair. novel. Yes. It's not gonna be good. Anyway, uh, well, we do have a lot to talk about today. So you were wise to tune in. We will be talking about uh, Trump and his team apparently worried about WATS uh, uh, lurking in Mar-a-Lago and perhaps the Trump org or elsewhere. We've got a guy apparently threatening uh, the FBI headquarters in Ohio. It's probably not related to anything though. It's probably total coincidence that a guy took a gun to the FBI headquarters and not related to anything that any high profile people have said in defense of Donald Trump, probably. And we've got a lot of other stuff. Beto O'Rourke's having a nice old time getting feisty at his campaign rallies and stuff like that. We got Ronnie Jackson talking about the apparent last food he'd want to eat again. It's gross, wait until we get to it and a whole lot more besides, including the rise of lonely single men. We've got some interesting stats and we're gonna have a fun little time talking about it. Also, Lauren Boebert, Congress Karen herself, tweeting about the Young Turks. And I'm gonna respond live on the show if you're watching the full show. In advance of that, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, that would be great. And if you wanna send us any comments, tweets, super chats, or anything else, we'll respond as we go. But with all that said, Adrian, are you ready to start the show? Hell yeah, let's do it. I like it, okay, let's do it. Donald Trump is apparently terrified that he's got a rap. Or a mole, or whatever else you call like a person around you who is revealing the secrets of the crimes you've committed. And you'll notice, of course, that like Tom Hanks never talks about worrying about rats around him because, like, when you aren't breaking the law, you don't worry about that sort of thing. But his fears are probably going to get even worse now that we found out that the FBI was apparently tipped off by an informer as to what documents he might have at Mar a Lago and where they are. And that was bad enough, but there was apparently one detail about what the informant was able to give the FBI that imply that it's someone very close to him. Take a look at this. How close do you think that person in Trump's orbit would have had to be to know these details about where these documents were? Uh, really, that's a good question, really close. I didn't even know there was a safe at uh, Mar-a-Lago and I was the chief of staff for 15 months. So this would be someone who was handling uh, things on day to day, who knew where documents were. So that would be somebody very close inside the president. My guess is there's probably six or eight people who had that kind of information. I don't know the people on the inside circle these days, so I can't give any names of folks who come to mind. But your, your instinct, I think, is a good one, is that if you know where the safe is and you know the documents are in 10 boxes in the basement, um, you are pretty close to the president. You were pretty close and that's going to scare Donald Trump, a guy who demands and never rewards loyalty. He wants it and someone is being disloyal. So that was Mick Mulvaney, former acting White House Chief of Staff. And I found what he had to say interesting, not only because he identified that it could only be one of about a half dozen people, but he was very careful to say, I, I didn't even know that the, the safe was there. And uh, it could only be like one of six, but I have no idea who. I don't, I'm not there. I don't know any of these people. It couldn't possibly, possibly be me. Please don't come for me, MAGA world. Now we're gonna have more details about uh, Trump's fear, his suspicion and paranoia, which has apparently been brewing for months at this point. But Adrian, I wanted your thoughts. This is like the first time we're checking in post raid. Um, the idea that it, it was it came from an informant. This was not just a, you know a fishing expedition, and it was someone close to him. This seems tailor made to infuriate Donald Trump. 
Oh, absolutely. You know, it seems that when he was, uh, you know, in the office of presidency, that he was always very suspicious of those who were around him or what was going on, and the thought that someone was out to get him. So this must upset him beyond measure. Uh, but I will also say, when it comes to who this rat or mole is, I find it very interesting uh, who people think that it possibly could be, because I think that there are a segment of people that are not being considered. And so I will be the first one to go ahead and put it out there, assuming I'm the first. I think it was Secret Service. Secret Service guards and protects him and is around him at all times. It's sworn oath to protect the Constitution from enemies, foreign and domestic. And I think that there's at least one agent there who has full knowledge of everything and decided to say what's up. I think that is fascinating. And I hadn't thought of it. I don't know if anyone else predicted it, but no, we were speculating yesterday on the show about who it might have been. And we were throwing out, you know, fun names, like if it was Jared or Ivanka, or I just I thought it would be cool if it was Ted Cruz. Um, but your answer makes a lot more sense because of course they would be around. Donald Trump would get used to them. Donald Trump yes. loves bragging about things. He likely bragged about the documents to the Secret Service agents. Yes. So yeah, why aren't more people talking about that? Exactly. Why was I? Why did I miss that? The agents are flies on the walls. It's like uh, it's like taxi drivers. People would say all sorts of things in taxi cabs, which is why, at least in Washington D.C., they learned their lesson when they realized that uh, taxi drivers became the source of a lot of leaks. It's the same thing with mm. Secret Service. They are sitting there the whole time, and you start to ignore them. Act like they're not there, and they know the intimate layout of all property, of what's going on. They're always guarding Mar-a-Lago, always there, always present, always with the president. So, you know, I actually think it was an agent who literally said, "What's up?" and yeah. signed away, got the protection as an informant. Especially now that the Secret Service is being kind of condemned for deleting all those text messages. I think that a lot of these agencies have. Um, they really need to rebuild their cachet with the American people. And so I wouldn't be surprised if this is the source of it. That is fascinating. Yeah, and if there's anyone in America who is well prepared to ignore the servants, I imagine it would probably be Donald Trump. Yeah, you're right to bring up the text messages. You know, I think that maybe that was influencing me too, the belief that they're around him. They're probably loyal to him, but just because they're trained to protect him or take a bullet for him doesn't mean that they like him. He's a very easy to not like guy. And also let's remember, I doubt that this is on their mind, but remember when he got COVID and he decided if I don't get out there and, and, and assert my <laughs> alphaness, they're gonna forget me, take me out in the car. He got in an enclosed car with secret service agents and breathed all of his, the normal weird germs he has, plus the COVID germs, endangering their lives to do a drive by waving and wheezing. Um, I don't know, if this was payback for that, that would be satisfying, it's probably not the case. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because also too, we have to remember that the vast majority of the agents are conservative people. Uh, so you can assume that they probably lean more toward the right, but the, there are members of the right who do not like Trump. A lot of them don't, they're not cultist. And the fact is that we're going to have an election in 2024. And the reality is that a lot of people may not care for Trump to be in that position, even if they vote along the red lines. So knowing that someone else will step up, especially with this whole DeSantis stuff, an agent may have gone ahead and said, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this guy. So this is, he's out of the equation. And so we can have a legitimate Republican run for office. Yeah, yeah, and it would seem like if the source was Secret Service agent, as opposed to like, I don't know, Stephen Miller decided to flip or whatever, it would seem harder to assail, you know, their credibility. But, yes. you know, if they ever like watched an Obama speech in 2007, that would be all it takes for them to rally opposition to the entirety of the Secret Service. In any event, before we get to some of the more reactions to this, I want to give you more about the original reporting that is leading to this perception that they're paranoid and they're searching for the rats. Rolling Stone says this summer, this is before the raid. He was asking associates if he thinks his communications are being monitored by the feds or per his phrasing by Biden. Like Biden is listening in real time to Donald Trump. He says, uh, do you think our phones are tapped? Given the sheer volume of investigations going on, I do not think he's assuming anything is outside the realm of possibility. And again, he's a dude who focuses on loyalty. Why wouldn't that go hand in hand with paranoia? He's apparently wondered aloud if any of the Republicans who visit his club could be wearing a wire. Uh, floated the idea that federal agents could be guilty of planting evidence, trying to figure out if they have a mole or a rat. Uh, apparently, 
Like <laughs> some of the people responding to this are saying uh, they're identifying to one of the aides to Trump. Uh, this guy must be an informant saying he should do phone checks of his staff. And the advisor says, to be honest, a lot of it feels like people trying to screw over the ones they don't like in Trump world, which is 100% what it is. All of them, they're just rats. They're climbing the rat pile to get close to the head cheese. And they're gonna throw each other to the bottom of it if they can by asserting that they're more loyal, they're disloyal. But again, just in terms of like your overall approach to things, what sort of person is constantly worried about rats and moles, is constantly worried about being recorded? A person who is on the up and up and honest? Now look, everybody has has a right to not you know, constantly have their private information being revealed. But if you're not breaking the law, if you're not doing and saying awful things, I don't think it should necessarily fill your every waking moment. You seem like a mobster. You seem like one of those people who knows how many skeletons are in their closet and is desperately scared that someone is going to open the closet at some point. That's what it feels like to me, Adrian. Yeah, and the thing is, I think the vast majority of people do not operate that way. And I think that you're right for the vast majority of instances. I think it's, you know, it's more of the anomaly of an innocent person being, you know, hounded by the government or being afraid someone's coming after them. And you know, Trump has created a life for himself. He has lived this journey that makes it so he has a target on his back. So that there is someone always possibly coming after him looking to right the wrong that he has done. It's like he he deserves this, he earns this. And it also goes to you know that thought that you never know what someone is going through or experiencing. And even though it may look like they're ascending and continue to do well, if someone is constantly terrorized by their own mentality inside their mind and their head, they're in hell the whole time. And that's something that I think puts a smile on people's face. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's a real shame. It bothers me so much. Uh, one person is bothered by all of this. So why don't we jump uh, directly in this next video? They do not want him in there and they're so hell bent on it. Guess what? We now know that there was an FBI informant at Mar-a-Lago, an FBI informant working at Mar-a-Lago. Who is that and how many other FBI informants are around President Trump on a daily basis, working at his clubs, working at Mar-a-Lago or maybe bed minister or on his staff? These are the things I want to know because they're traitors. They are traitors and they're helping the deep state and they're helping the people. These are the enemies within, these are the real enemies. First of all, minor point, it's Bedminster, you doofus. You utter, utter doofus. She doesn't, she doesn't know what she's talking about, uh, but she is talking. Why is she talking? Why does she have this show? She's still technically an elected representative. I don't know, she has a lot of time to uh, podcast and opine about traitors and treason and all of that. And again, like with our prior talk about Donald Trump, the fact that she is like denouncing traitors in his orbit, that doesn't seem to me to be the honest expression of a person who feels like this guy hasn't done anything wrong and they're just trying to frame him. It seems like a person who knows full well what Donald Trump is, how he operates, what he has done and is perfectly comfortable with it. The only part they're not comfortable with is those dark secrets being revealed. She wants loyalty to him. She doesn't want him to abide by the law. That is the last thing on her list of priorities. And she knows what her audience is. And so while later in her show, she'll give a little bit of a nod to, oh, the rats are probably planting stuff. But if the FBI is just like, like willy nilly making up all of this, why do they need the rat? What's the point of the rat at that point? Why would you be worried about all these different people turning on? First of all, why would so many people be turning on him? That's an interesting question to interrogate. But again, the overall impression is this is a movement that doesn't care what he's done. They're never gonna accept any of the evidence that comes out. All of this is damage control and fighting to prove that they're the most loyal.
Oh, absolutely, especially MTG. You know, it's just what this past weekend at CPAC when she was interviewed, she said uh, when asked about if she would be a vice president, she's like, yeah, there are talks, the possibility of you know the uh-huh. candidacy there. Clearly, she's trying to still preserve that opportunity for her come ups. And you know, it's like it's so ridiculous these things that this woman is saying just so she can try to legitimize uh, the situation in terms of Trump and this whole narrative about him being innocent and being attacked by the system. This woman. Mm-hmm. Really, just trying to protect what she expects will hopefully uplift her to a point in a place where she will be, she won't just be a stain on the United States forever. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Yeah, does she know that if oh, she's yeah. VP, she probably has to stop doing her podcast? I don't know. Yeah, anyway, there's yeah. probably some actual work to do. I don't know. Anyway, I want to give you one more thing from her show. She said, that is why it's the most dangerous time for President Trump and his family and anyone in its orbit, me included, because these people will stop at nothing. They don't want a second President Trump term. Here's why, because he is dead serious and he knows who his enemies are and he is gonna finish the job he started in his first four years. So that is implying without stating as many of the others have that they're going to try to assassinate Donald Trump. Again, why they wouldn't have done it five years ago if that's what they were planning, I don't know. But if you're a conservative and you're watching this, like, what is the pitch that she is giving to you about Donald Trump and why he should be president again? He's dead serious, he knows who his enemies are, and he's gonna finish the job he started. Is that acknowledging like your pain, the crises facing you and your family? Is that policy focused? Is that about an agenda? No, it's he's madder, madder than ever, and he knows who his enemies are. No, that sounds like you're getting a vindictive proto dictator. That's what it sounds like she wants. Why that's so appealing to you is something that I think demands a little bit of thought, a little bit of self analysis. Yeah, seriously, John, you're totally spot on. And the fact that people can't see this is so incredibly strange to me. This man is, um, you know, she's talking about him being in the highest position, uh, leading mm-hmm. our nation. And her best argument for that is he'll be vindictive and he'll retaliate. How is that gonna help the American people for Trump to use his platform to get all these little vendettas out? Like, get out of yeah. here with that. This is ridiculous. Yeah, have you have you ever heard us be like, Man, 2016 was rough, but in 2020, Bernie's back. He's gonna ream all these a holes. <laughs> no, <it's not. laughs> Sounds like a movie trailer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, AOC's not taking any prisoners this time. No, she's she's trying to pass the Green New Deal. That, that's what she's trying to do. Bernie wants you to have dental care. He's not trying to mount heads on pikes. Yeah. But again, we viewed uh, a government and the promise of government a little bit differently. Yeah, is that really what you want from leadership, John? Is that really what you want? It's not what I want. It's not what I want. I want the Punisher. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't want dark Bernie. I don't want dark Bernie rises. Although now I want to Photoshop that. Maybe someone can do that. Anyway, look, we've given you a little bit of the people in the Trump orbit, a little bit of, you know, like the, the greens and that sort of stuff, how they're processing this. But what about the regular everyday MAGA Looney Tune? Let's turn now to this. You don't think that there was a real reason to come no, here? It's just a show. I, it's not even think. I know there's no real reason. I know it in my heart. I know it in my spirit. He has never lied about anything. Many of the supporters were saying to me that the FBI and the Department of Justice are corrupt. I was quick to point out to them that it was Donald Trump who appointed Christopher Wray as director of the FBI, but they continued to say that he was corrupt. We also talked about Hillary Clinton's emails. I reminded them that it was Donald Trump who called for an investigation into uh, her classified emails, uh, but the irony was lost on them. They continued to say that he didn't do anything wrong, and she did. So that is Randy Kay of CNN um, doing God's work in talking to these people who I would describe as definitely sane. Yeah. No, they're look, they're retirees with a lot of time on their hand and not a lot of critical thinking skills. They believe whatever they're told by Jesse Waters, and this is what you get based on that. Uh, no, none of those facts are going to get through them. It's great that Randy Kay tried to remind them that, like, no, he picked all these people. Why does he keep picking corrupt people if he's the best? If he's the best. The best people. Why does he keep people keep picking these people who are actually corrupt? And inevitably, it turns out that they're in the deep state or whatever. Um, the, the fact that he got them to chant "lock her up for years" about her having an email server or whatever, but him literally stealing boxes of documents and refusing to give them back. It isn't even that now that he's been raided, they're willing to say, "Oh, they're both bad." So let's like let's forget about it. No, they're saying he's still not bad. 
despite him using his personal phone and basically everyone in the White House doing exactly what it was that infuriated them for so many years with Hillary Clinton. It doesn't make them both bad, he's still fine. They will not, there is no fact that won't wash off their back. You were saying earlier in the show that they're, they're, they're not a cult, that not all of them are, not some of the members of the Secret Service. And I, and I agree, not everyone is. But some percentage, man, they are as devoted as any robe-wearing <laughs> cultist. Oh, absolutely. And and when I said not a cult, I meant members of the GOP. Like there are Republicans who are not in this cultist following of Donald Trump at all. But these individuals who are are extremely scary because you're absolutely right in terms of them not necessarily having the analytical skills or even just the logic or possibly sanity. Because really, it's it, it it would be one thing if people said. Well, I just don't want the rules to apply to him. Like I recognize there's possible hypocrisy in that, but I'm cool with that. I would respect that to the end of time. Because if you just want exceptions for certain people, cool, all right, that's how you roll. But for people not to even see the basic logic of how they were screaming about the emails, and then now they think that it's okay or whatever if he has these documents. I just, that, it just really makes me wonder, are you okay? Were you dropped on the head? How does this work? Yeah, 100%, no, there's just, there's no, like again, like we 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 feel this need to point out the hypocrisy because hypocrisy. Sh- we should all be able to agree that it's wrong. That we should try to live our lives with some sort of principles, principles that apply to multiple situations and are, to the extent that we're capable, as basically barely evolved chimpanzees, able to apply principles fairly, both to people we like and people we don't. But that is not a universal value. It's not even a universal value across all of the left. Let's keep it real, but for the right, no, they don't value it. They value power, they value people who get away with crimes. They want to get away with crimes, thus their inspiration are gonna be people who get away with crimes. They don't care, they're not interested. He could he could have been using Hillary's secret server and they wouldn't care. Nothing's gonna get through to them. They like Trump, thus he can do no wrong. Anyway, with that said, we should probably go to our first break because when we come back, we've got some uh, some late breaking news, a threat to the FBI. Who could have predicted it? We'll have that and more after this. I always wish those breaks were like five or six minutes. That'd be nice. We never get to enough messages. There's a lot more. We will get to them in a future break. Uh, for now, though, oh, okay, we have. Hold on a second. Uh, okay, no, I don't think that I want to go to that cold open. Actually, I apologize for the behind the scenes stuff. Just because I want to give that update first, basically. Are you, and then you we'll getting the again. update about this breaking news? Yeah, well, I, but you may you may see something even more breaking than I am. So feel free to jump in. But I'll <laughs> launch us into it and we'll start discussing it. All right. God, now I wonder what it is. Nobody could have seen it coming after a couple of days of blanket accusations that the FBI isn't just investigating Donald Trump. They are definitely planting evidence, fabricating stuff. They might assassinate Trump and they're definitely gonna be coming for you and your families and your guns and whatever. A guy has apparently threatened the FBI headquarters in Cincinnati, Ohio. Local news stations say that the man made threats there and then promptly drove away. The Ohio State Patrol then pursued him. They announced a lockdown around the area. And apparently, as of at least recently, that guy was involved in a standoff with police and multiple shots had been fired. Now, I want you to be very careful about any of these facts because they are changing rapidly. So he is said to have had an AR-15 style weapon, but they also said that as he was going to leave the FBI building and he was being pursued, He apparently fired a nail gun at some of the agents who were following him. So I don't know what if any of that will turn out to be true. If he is involved in a standoff, I don't know for sure that shots have been fired. And if they were, whether they came from the rifle, which might or might not exist, or the nail gun, which he for some reason apparently has. But as of right now, that's what we know. A guy decided this week to go to the FBI headquarters, make threats, and is now engaged in some sort of shootout according to initial reports. Adrian, I know you, you've been looking for the latest news on this because we're doing this live. What have you been seeing? 
Okay, so in terms of the FBI, I actually, um, I haven't necessarily seen anything specific as about this incident. Although I do believe this is a direct product of Trump and GOP uh, waging this uh, verbal attack on the FBI because they raided Mar-a-Lago. But um, the news just broke that a that actually Trump was subpoenaed for those documents this spring. And so essentially he ignored the subpoena much like Bannon, which is why the FBI went in. So Trump had plenty of notice that they wanted those documents. He's no victim here at all. He had notice that they wanted the documents and they sent him a subpoena and he ignored it. Mm. So you're implying that yesterday on the five when Janine Pirro was slur screaming her way through, no, he complied, he was cooperating. That she might have not had the facts on her side. There is that where you're implying? That that that's my uh, that's my interpretation at this moment, without a doubt. It seems that a lot of those GOPers out there who were claiming that Trump is a victim and attacked by the system and this is so egregious, he had noticed that this was going to go down. So he's in that same camp with Bannon. It's cute. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think that he gambled, and I think it was a pretty reasonable gamble. The idea that that they would like haul him away if he didn't comply seemed hard to imagine. So I get why he went with what he went with. Um, the issue for us going forward, though, is that that fact that you just revealed is utterly irrelevant to the right wing. They will not care at all because he shouldn't comply with any of that because he's an innocent, good person and in fact a victim and get off his back. Also, he's the strongest person ever and he doesn't need anyone to defend him. But anyway, um, they are defending him with narratives, if not facts. And the narrative is that the FBI is a tool of the deep state. The deep state that apparently is utterly powerless because the QAnoners tell me that Trump has actually been president for the past couple of years. So the whole thing gets a little bit muddled. But, but we do know that the FBI is out of control and lawless. And it's lawless. Not because of all of the terrible things it's done throughout its history. It's lawless starting a few days ago when they decided to raid Donald Trump's house. And they have been demonizing the FBI in a false way, co-opting legitimate progressive critiques of law enforcement. And what do you know, a crazy person has gone out there. I don't, I don't remember exactly what I said if it was yesterday or two days ago. But I talked about the fact that the people who are listening to these Fox News defenses of Trump, some of them are crazy, some of the crazies have guns. And so I said, I don't know when that will manifest, if it'll be a day or a week, but it turned out to be a day. You know, maybe we'll find out that this guy was just a regular conservative who wanted to kill FBI agents, not related to Trump. They've wanted to do that for a very long time, but it certainly seems suspicious. It seems coincidental, Adrian. Oh, absolutely. You know, the fact is that I think generally people don't go after the FBI. It would seem like they have, you know, numbers and all sorts <laughs> of backup. Uh, so it really is not logical for people to all of a sudden have some kind of, um, you know, angst or aggression directed specifically at the FBI and willing to take it out on them. So for this individual to be what in, I believe, a cornfield shooting and firing at the FBI, I think it's yep. possibly because they feel they've received some directive from members of the GOP, uh, particularly those who are supporting Trump. Yeah, yeah, and look, to be fair, um, you know Jesse Waters, Laura Ingram are never gonna come out and say, the time has come to shoot FBI agents, but they have spent literally years terrifying these people to believe that some government agent is gonna come knocking on their door to take their guns because of something Trump did or whatever. Or because they're IRS agents now, that's targeting you rather than the rich who get away with tax fraud and economic effective murder. I don't know, I'm looking for updates right now in real time. It seems like they have contained the guy, but they still have a lockdown. That's the news I've gotten out of the Cincinnati area, that and that the Cincinnati Zoo has narrowed the potential names for a new baby hippo from 90,000 to two. It's either gonna be Fritz or Ferguson, so get your votes in while you can. In any event, um, we're gonna keep watching for this. It doesn't seem as if anyone has been injured, let alone killed at this point, but situation could develop rapidly, so bear that in mind. Anyway, why don't we jump ahead to this video actually.
They can, but it's dishonest. Yeah. I mean, it was like they stumbled onto something that they realized, in my view, gave them the excuse to go in there. And this magistrate judge just rubber stamped it. You know, we don't know the politics of this guy. We know he donated to Barack Obama. Uh, we know he was critical of President Trump a couple of times online uh, when he had said something about John Lewis. He came out and he he was, clearly doesn't like President Trump. Um, but well, in any event, on, allow me, allow me. We just put together a little full screen for you right there. Judge Reinhardt's liberal resume. You're right. He donated thousands to Barack Obama twice, not just in the way, but twice. Yep. Represented employees of convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein and donated to Trump's opponent, Jeb Bush, in 2015 and 2016. Okay, so uh, there has been this full court press against both the FBI and also in particular, the judge who apparently signed off on the warrant to search Mar-a-Lago. And uh, you can tell that it's a serious journalistic enterprise digging into his past because they decided to put up a photo of him eating Oreos for some reason that I will never understand. Um, but he apparently did donate some money to Barack Obama. And that means that he is unacceptable as a judge. What we are learning there from Laura or Megyn Kelly and um, Newsmax is that no one can be a judge if they made political donations. Because, well, I mean, I assume that's what they mean. They must be expressing an actual principle. They wouldn't be just pointing that out in this case and wouldn't want to apply it to any others, right? They wouldn't believe that you can't have weighed in in any way on politics ever and be involved in our judicial system. Of course, they don't think that they're perfectly fine with people donating to Trump and getting uh, judicial positions. Anyway, they find it to be convincing in this case because this guy years and years ago gave money to Barack Obama, who I guess is a communist or something. In any event, their criticism of him, their photos of him eating Oreos has had the predictable effect, which is that online on uh, pro Donald Trump message boards and other websites, there are a number of violent anti-Semitic threats against the judge. What do you know? They went to death threats and they went to anti-Semitism almost instantaneously. They've been posting what they believe to be his home address, phone numbers, and names of his family members, including messages like this. This is a piece of S judge who approved FBI's raid on Mar-a-Lago. I see a rope around his neck. Another, this is on the Donald, by the way. Everyone was aggrieved when the Donald was thrown off of Reddit. I wonder why they felt they had to throw it off. They're threatening to lynch a judge and going on to say, let's find out if he has children, where they go to school, where they live, everything. One apparently said, let's cut off his bloodline, which means murder his kids. Do you get where they're going with this? So. Yeah, they identify the judge. They throw up uh, mocking photos of him on on uh, on Newsmax and stuff like that. They talk about him on Fox. And what do you know? The anti-Semitism, the death threats, the threats to wipe out his entire family follow soon after. Adrian, what do you think? Okay, so initially when I heard about this judge and uh, there were these allegations online that he had represented Epstein or whatever, I was like, yeah, so I, I could care less. And then learning more about the situation, uh, number one, okay. So it's completely and totally unacceptable, number one, to engage in this anti-Semitism. That's incredibly disgusting. Number two, the thought that they're doxing his family members and his children, that's extremely problematic in part because the families and children, they need to ultimately be protected by the US Marshals because right now it would just be that judge. And so that's incredibly unacceptable. It's 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 not okay and I really do hope the US Marshals are stepping up to protect this judge. This isn't okay. Also, you know, initially I guess when I had learned about his ties to Epstein or at least uh, it turns out he was represented uh, some of Epstein's colleagues or friends or uh, employees. You know, I do appreciate that as a lawyer, you do defend all sorts of people who you wouldn't necessarily like or engage with or spend time with. And so I, as much as I would like to give him a pass on that, now I do more so than I did initially um, because I, just, I don't necessarily know what his motives were, even though I wouldn't get have gotten close to Epstein or thought that that was acceptable at mm. all. I think that that's a totally fair critique. Um, but again, like, do they have an issue with the, the judge getting his position before? You know, yeah, because of exactly. that, 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 that honest issue that they have with the guy having represented them. No, it, look, if we could jump ahead to our final graphic here, you know, who else comes on Newsmax constantly? Uh, Alan Dershowitz comes on Fox. So, what is the standard that you are implying you have for people representing 
Epstein affiliated people or I don't know, representing Epstein. Like, I just wanna know what the standard is supposed to be so that I can process this. Um, I would be perfectly fine with saying, I like, let's get money totally out of politics. Then you never need to worry about your judges having donated to candidates. But that is not what they're actually saying. And I will remind you, by the way, as they're like rallying the troops to go after this guy, as the death threats are coming in, we're what? Two weeks, maybe three out of the news cycle of they're coming after the SCOTUS over Roe v. Wade. We need to pass legislation instantly, instantly to defend them. How dare anyone peacefully protest near a member of the SCOTUS? Oh, this guy signed off on a warrant to investigate Trump, dispatch the anti Semites. Go find his kids, find their school. What happens, happens is effectively the approach that they have there. Again, I am just desperately looking for one actual principle, an actual standard that is not based entirely on political opportunism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I think you're gonna be looking for some time, John. The fact is that these people do not think the law or any kind of rules or regulation should apply to a certain segment of our population, whether it's white, male, and privileged. But it's disgusting that this is who these people are. I just wish they would be honest about it. Yeah. It so much. Okay, we're gonna. Oh, oh, I see, Sophie. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're not gonna let me go to another story after I very reasonably went to an early break before. Uh, it's 10:38. It would be totally reasonable to go on, but for Sophie's sake, we're gonna take a little break. When we come back, uh, some of the uh, you know the biggest names in Hollywood are trying to get Hollywood to have an actual standard when it comes to the sort of candidates they donate to. We'll give you the details on that and more after this. Okay, everybody, let's talk about something completely different. With just hours remaining before a uh, a deadline that was put forward in late July to uh, address Hollywood's approach to abortion, what sort of politicians they're gonna support, where they're going to do their productions. They've put out a statement to some extent. It's described as being full of boilerplate remarks. They say they share uh, the uh, high profile uh, showrunners and writers concerns around the health, safety and well being of dedicated employees and the people who support our productions. Um, but anyway, look, these are important execs. They represent Disney, Netflix, Apple TV, NBC Universal, Amazon, Warner Brothers, AMC. I mean, that's so much. And they've been pressured by these people to come clear about what their agenda is gonna be when it comes to abortion. And if we could bring that up for one more second. You'll see huge names, Shauna Rhimes, Issa Rae, Minda Kaley, Natasha Leone, a whole lot of different people. And um, so they basically gave 10 business days for these execs to review what's called their abortion safety plan. And that message that they put out, you know, it's got vague, nice language about solidarity. What it's lacking is specifics. It does not go into whether they're gonna donate to anti-abortion candidates or PACs that support anti-abortion candidates or ballot measures. That's a pretty big one. And look, they can have whatever position they want. It's corporate America, they can be rabidly anti-abortion. But thankfully, we've got some high profile people who are gonna use their platform to make sure that if that's the direction that Hollywood's gonna go in, that people should know about it. And they get to decide if they want to support companies who are actively trying to get into office people who are trying to strip your rights away. Adrian, what do you think about this? You know, I really do appreciate that these um, actors are using their platform and their voice and also producers and people who have some power in the industry and pushing uh, you know, Hollywood execs to make decisions that are more inclusive for them, particularly because this is something that primarily impacts women when it comes to abortion and having access to it. And also, um, you know, just the thing is that Hollywood is uh, it's the United States greatest export. And it's something that will radiate and emanate hopefully around the world in terms of the actions that they take. So this can have significant implications. And I'm really, really glad again that these people are using their privilege, their position and their power to push back. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I mean, we, look, we didn't name everyone there, but it's very, very high profile women in Hollywood. Um, in addition, if we could jump ahead to graphic seven, there was uh, not long ago, I think it was in the last couple of weeks, um, a group of 600 male showrunners and writers also sent a similar sort of letter uh, talking about the the crisis that was coming when it comes to these rights. So, you know, you you don't you don't often see a lot of solidarity in Hollywood like you. You briefly had a good number of people who are at least giving lip service to the Me Too movement. 
Other than that, like there's been a little bit of support from some uh, actors and actresses and producers on, uh, for instance, She-Hulk. They were uh, raising the profile of the uh, the issues that are facing CGI artists, their tough working conditions and all that. Um, but you you don't often see it, like, and and it's an important issue. It's it's a huge issue. I think that it's their right to use this if they want to, and it's going to be interesting to see in particular. I see people in the chat talking about this. Um, what's going to happen with Atlanta, where more and more filming is being done for TVs and movies. Of course, it's in a state that, you know, the the law is going to end up being pretty barbaric when it comes to this. If you know, if recent elections or anything to go by, and so it's going to be interesting to see does this affect projects that might go to Georgia in the near future? Yeah, and I. I think that it will impact projects. You know, Georgia has been very hospitable to Hollywood, and there are a lot of large studios that do operate there regularly. I think CNN is also headquartered there. And Gavin Newsom, I think he invited a lot of Hollywood to come to California instead. And of course, they're gonna have to make it a little bit more hospitable to film in California. But you know, it's it should be good in terms of, or it's a good thing to have these states face consequences for the decisions that they're making. These financial consequences are important, absolutely. Exactly, yeah, people take this stuff seriously and they're right to. Okay, uh, with that, I'm looking at the time and trying to figure out, I think we'll continue. We're gonna, we're gonna give some respect to the D block for once. We've skipped <laughs> it several times this week. So with that, why don't we move um, into this? With the threat of monkeypox out there, it's uh, maybe easy to forget that we're not out of this COVID pandemic. And I don't just mean new cases of COVID. Long COVID remains, and there is more and more evidence that it's affecting a lot of people. There's some recent CDC data showing that nearly one in five people who had been infected with COVID-19 have some form of long COVID. That means literally tens of millions of working age adults right now. And the symptoms can be non-existent for long COVID. They can be mild, they can be very serious, including possibly death. You can look at this list, fatigue that interferes with daily activities. And and honestly, I wanna wanna stop there for one second because fatigue doesn't necessarily get across the experience that people are having. Fatigue can mean to you that you haven't had your coffee yet in the morning. There are people saying that they they have a very difficult time going about any of their daily routines for months and months and months at a time. That is going to affect people in their personal lives, but also in their working lives as well. You've got difficulty breathing, coughs, chest pain. A lot of these things honestly sound like COVID, except that they last for a long time. Changes in menstrual cycles, muscle pain, depression or anxiety, other psychological effects as well as health effects. And right now, there's no like one set way that doctors know to treat this. Instead, they're generally chasing the symptoms that people experience. And when they have trouble dealing with those, or because of you know our generalized healthcare crisis, if they have not the money to pay for it, then they might go to other sorts of untested or unproven remedies to deal with these things. It's regular people, lots of people. It's also some of the elites who are thankfully drawing some attention to this. Senator Tim Kaine said, uh, that he feels as if for two years now, as if every nerve ending in my body has had five cups of coffee. I can feel every nerve ending right now as I'm talking to you, he told Politico. It's just kind of a tingling in my veins all the time. As one individual, Charles McCone said, before my mild infection, I was a healthy fit 30 year old biking 10 miles a day with no prior health issues. The type of person the CDC says should bounce back after two weeks. Well, it's been two years and I've yet to bounce back. I can't work or leave the house. I rely on my partner as a full time caretaker. I still can't breathe right. It's a living nightmare. And Charles has a thread up on Twitter about that. So, like, I know that doctors are dealing with this, Adrian, and the people who are experiencing it, their close family members and friends might know about it. But I kind of almost feel like we've come out of this pandemic forgetting that that is still a serious concern that's affecting a lot of people. Yeah, and I think that that's right up our alley as the United States often likes to neglect people and their health issues. And the reality is we're gonna have an entire generation of people who are going to be struggling with this long COVID for the rest of their lives. And when there's all this talk about dropping social security and not providing for people, we're damned or not talking about universal health care. It yeah. really does tell you that the United States does not care about people and it is going to suffer.
in the years to come because we're going to have again this entire generation that can't necessarily care for itself or will be suffering and struggling from things and can't contribute to you know the market and being able to be a part of the working class and yet we have no support system in place for them mm-hmm. this is this is just ridiculous yeah, exactly. Um, and look, uh, for, for me, the effect on individual people is what matters. We have um, in the chat, I saw Ghost Dog says, I used to train MMA six days a week, COVID ruined my life. Like imagine if like, just the effect on like on your work, on your, you know, your love life, your social life, your hobbies, those sorts of things, it, it can affect so many people. But like if the experience of individual people doesn't matter to you, it's also a massive drain on the economy that they're not working, thus not producing, they're not then paying taxes on income that they would be making. So from the government's point of view, seems like the sort of thing that you'd want to deal with. And it's affecting a measurable percentage of the entire US population. And so look, Congress last year gave the National Institute of Health $1 billion to look into this. They're gonna need to continue that funding. Doctors are gonna need to prioritize this. We're gonna hopefully try to figure out clusters of symptoms and you know the most efficient and cost effective ways to deal with this. But it is still a big issue and it's gonna it's likely going to be affecting people for the rest of our life. Absolutely. Okay, with that, we've got a few minutes left. Why don't we move into our e block? I I see that, Sophie. Thank you. Why don't we jump into this? I'm gonna make sure that now eleven weeks since we lost 19 kids and their two teachers. Shot to death with a weapon originally designed for use in combat, legally purchased by an 18 year old who did not try to obtain one when he was 16 or 17, but followed the law that's on the books, ladies and gentlemen, that says that you can buy not one, you could buy two or more if you want to, AR 15s, hundreds of rounds of ammunition. And take that weapon that was originally designed for use on the battlefields in Vietnam to penetrate an enemy soldier's helmet at 500 feet and knock him down dead up against kids at five feet. It may be funny to you, mother but it's not funny to me, okay? So Beto got a pretty good response to that line right there. I mean, many of the people in the room were supporters of his candidacy, but there were a few uh, counter pro- protesters, I guess. And he got some heckling. And look, the heckling can be annoying in the best of times, but when you're talking about children being murdered in the state you're in, very recently, the idea that you as a protester would take that opportunity to attack a candidate who's raising this issue. And trying to make sure that the country doesn't forget about it, doesn't just move on, that's a weird time to attack him. And so while I, look, I, I, I would criticize Beto on quite a bit. I think that on policy, he's been very hit or miss. His candidacies sometimes have gone to some weird places. And, and I can't say that that's not to some extent an artificial thing. Like he wants to have that moment with the protester. I get why people would be fired up by that, Adrian. But what, what did you think about it? You know, seeing some people and their responses to lives being taken and their love of supporting guns and defending it, it's just, it's so incredibly disheartening because this is, these are baseless, baseless actions. These are disgusting human beings who are out here who thinks it's acceptable to mock the idea that children were slaughtered and murdered and that law enforcement didn't protect them, that these weapons that were used to take their lives are completely and totally ridiculous in the hands of civilians and to mock it. Like get out of here, that yeah. that just, it's depraved. Yeah, I just, it, I think depraved is the perfect word for it. Um, now the, the issue is that despite I mean, being so obviously better on this issue, uh, the polling still pretty rough. So we're going to show you uh, some of the recent polls going back, uh, you know, a couple of months there. Actually, longer than a couple of months there. Um, and Abbott, look, Abbott's not like totally blowing him away, but in the most recent polls, he's still five, six, seven, eight points up. But this is an issue that I think uh, you know Beto is right to focus on. Back in December, when asked uh, voters there, when they were asked who would do a better job on gun policy. Abbott got 60%, O'Rourke got 33. Just in the last week, it's now 47 Abbott, 43 O'Rourke. So a very tight narrowing there. But you know, elections aren't 
aren't done just about one uh, one issue. So it makes sense for better to focus on this. But uh, oh, Abbott is a guy who can be criticized on so many different things, energy policy, immigration, abortion, all these issues. And so I think Beto needs to keep hitting him and hitting him harder. Anyway, uh, for those of you watching on our linear platforms or on the podcast, thank you so much for watching. But if you're on the full show, we got a lot more news to get to, including responding to Lauren Boebert tweeting about the Young Turks. We have all that and more after this. HP Potion says, please don't call her MTG as a magic fan. It always gets my hackles up. I know I'm never gonna get past that either. I also <laughs> like- I have no idea what that reference is in terms of magic. Oh, it's uh, so there's a card game called Magic the Gathering. Called okay, MTG. we can stop there, it's good, yeah. So what it is, is <laughs> it's a collectible card anyway. Um, I mostly don't want to call her that because in the same way that the the woman, the, the Republican woman who challenged AOC tried to be like, I forget what ACR or something. Like you're, you're just doing that last minute to get what AOC has. That's all you're doing. You, you, you didn't call yourself that. She didn't call herself Marjorie Taylor Greene back when she was doing all of her vlogs. It's just marketing and I'm not part of her PR team. So I'm not interested in doing that. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.